worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac's back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Mota Zitabanakis. See, welcome back into another edition of the Worst Wrestling Podcast. We are doing a short edition today, and this is the review of ECW One Night Stand 2006. Once again, returning to the ball scene. <laughs> I call it the ball scene. The Harrisine uh, Ballroom in uh, New York. Uh, great fucking venue. Awesome crowd. One Night Stand 2005 and 2006 honestly kind of get a little mixed up in my brain a lot of the time. And I think it's because I really love ECW One Night Stand 2005. That one felt more like a true standalone where, yes, WWE was involved, but it really felt like, uh, you know, Paul Heyman and uh, RVD had their hands on the creative wheel. For that show. By 2006, we still got a really great pay per view, but you could definitely smell a little bit of the Vince McMahon involvement at this point because now it was, uh, this was when they were announcing that they were going to the Sci Fi Channel and ECW was going to be a third brand. And so there was a lot of kerfuffle, a lot of, it felt like there were a lot more hands in the cookie jar for this one. But it was still a great show. Um, I think in a perfect world, if you could take the entire 2005 show and just on the on the end of it, just th- take the main event from 2006 and put that on the end of the ECW One Night Stand from 2005, that might have literally been one of the greatest pay-per-views in the entire history of all of wrestling. But... As it is, they are separate. Uh, But we start with uh, Paul Heyman kicking off the show this time. uh, And we get, uh, like I mentioned, a great Paul Heyman promo. He mentions the return of ECW as the third brand on the Sci-Fi Network, uh, which we all know how that worked out. Uh, But then you get Taz versus Jerry the King Lawler uh, in a hilarious announcer versus announcer match. And I remember at the time thinking, like, how are they going to do this? Because I'm pretty sure Taz, like, just couldn't really wrestle at this point uh, in his career. But they did this great uh, bit where basically Jerry Lawler, who is an amazing fucking heel, uh, he comes out and he slaps Joey Styles before going down to the ring. And so once he goes down and gets in the ring, Joey Styles actually comes in, uh, jumps on his back. Lawler kind of swings him around and slams him down. And then Taz uh, sneaks in behind Lawler as he's trying to give a pile driver to Joey Styles. uh, Taz sneaks in and gets the Taz mission, and he puts Jerry Lawler out to sleep, and Taz comes away with the win. Uh, And this was just basically like a great segment to open up the show. And then we get our first actual match, which was Randy Orton versus Kurt Angle. And man, Kurt is so fucking good that the ECW crowd actively adopted him, even though he is kind of the antithesis in terms of his persona of what you would think of an ECW wrestler when you talk about an amateur wrestling machine, an Olympic gold medalist, the fucking milk drinking, non like, you know what I mean? Like Kurt Angle uh, very what uh, a very kind of cookie cutter white bread type of guy definitely doesn't strike me as like you know except for that again he's just an absolute fucking wrestling machine and intense as fuck in the ring like doesn't strike you as an ECW guy whatsoever and yet the crowd absolutely adopted him uh you you got amazing uh fuck him up angle fuck him up chance right at the beginning. Um, you know, you had 
Angle basically working the ankle the whole match. You had Randy Orton uh, working the neck. And the final sequence, uh, Randy goes for an RKO, and Angle just grabs him by the shoulders and slams him down on the mat, uh, goes to grab the ankle lock. Um, Randy gets him in a roll-up, uh, but then Kurt kicks out of the roll-up, but not without grabbing onto the ankle lock. Like This just reminded me again of how fucking good Kurt Angle was in the ring. And, you know, credit to Randy Orton as well, because Randy was incredible in this match too. But, man, this was just, this was a fucking banger of a match. Like, this was an A-plus match between Kurt Angle and Randy Orton at ECW One Night Stand. Uh, and both guys just played their part fucking to measure. Even even after the match, post-match, uh, Randy demanding two referees, not one, not just one guy under his two referees to carry him out. Uh, of the arena just to piss off the crowd that extra little bit just again oh oh and this was to kick this was like the first like real official match match because like obviously a Taz versus Lawler but that was more of a bit this was just a fucking banger um so you know that was a plus and then we got uh super crazy and Tajiri Versus the full-blooded Italians. Hey, it's Nunzio. Uh, but yeah, uh, basically you ended up having uh, the FBI go over. There was this really cool spot um, where uh, Super Crazy and Tajiri hit double tarantulas in opposing corners. Uh, but ultimately FBI go over with this like cool-looking double muscle buster. Uh, there was also one spot uh, where Joey Styles... Uh, on announcing says, uh, yeah, here at ECW, we don't send super crazy out on a lawnmower. So I thought that was kind of funny, taking a shot at Vince McMahon and that stupid-ass fucking gimmick he made uh, with the Mexicools. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, FBI goes over, but then Big Show comes out. Uh, and if you guys all remember Big Show and his uh, run in ECW, uh, he didn't have a match on the card. He basically just came out and kicked the shit out of everybody. Uh, took out Tajiri, super crazy. Took out the FBI, including Big uh, Big Guido. Um, so yeah, just looking dominant and also looking fierce. And that was a time too where Big Show was like looking real fit too. So yeah, Easy W Big Show. The uh, the idea of it was potentially very scary and could have they could have done some real cool shit with it. it. Ended up being like Big Show and Mark Henry feud is all I really remember from that era, but. The idea of like an unhinged big show in like ECW matches, like I I like I like where they were trying to go with it at least, um, in terms of a character. Uh we got a quick JBL promo that was not quick, it was JBL fucking going on and on to the point that the crowd is uh chanting, shut the fuck up. Uh and then behind the only part that was funny about this whole promo is that behind him, the security guard kind of looked like Stone Cold Steve Austin if you ordered him from Wish, and there was a dude wearing a Rey Mysterio mask, so it just looked like two really janky versions of like Stone Cold and Rey Mysterio behind him. But then we get the actual Rey Mysterio uh, versus Sabu in a dream match for the World Heavyweight Championship, so this is the big gold uh, WCW title that they brought over during the invasion stuff. And, uh, you know, this was a fucking bomb ass match with a dumb fucking ending. And it's one of the things that really sticks in my craw and, you know, was very prevalent during the Vince McMahon era, especially of, uh, booking even in the earlier Vince McMahon days, but then going all the way to the late stage Vince McMahon stuff, it was just fucking brutal. Some of the, you know, absolutely fucking like four and five star matches that would end in absolute drizzling shits. And this was one of them. But before that, uh, it was funny because Rey Mysterio actually got booed pretty solid in this match. And it's like, I don't remember really any point in Rey Mysterio's career, except maybe like some of the early WCW days when he was doing some heel work there. Like I don't remember any time in WWF, uh, WWE where Rey Mysterio was actively booed by the crowd. 
but I'm telling you, the ECW crowd, the, Sabu is a fucking legend to them. And they were booing Ray in favor of Sabu. Uh, but you had a lot of great spots here. You had dueling chairs, Air Sabu, uh, counter, and then uh, Ray Mysterio hits Air Mysterio, which was like um, he hit the double, uh, sorry, the triple jump off the chair into like a Hurricane Rana that looked fucking cool. Uh, you had so many high spots like Arabian face buster, table spots outside, triple jump moonsault, triple jump DDT through the table. And then that was the end of the match. Like it looked cool as fuck. I don't get me wrong. Uh, rain, they, they had the table set up to where it was on the ring apron and the barrier, uh, for the crowd. And Ray Mysterio's on it and he gets up. And uh, Sabu hits perfectly the triple jump into the DDT through the table. And that they call the match. They're like, some random fucking dude comes out and he's like, they can't compete anymore. I'm like, this is fucking Sabu that we're talking about. The homicidal, genocidal, suicidal Sabu. You're telling me this guy can't fucking continue? This man wrapped his fucking arm after dicing it open with barbed wire? This man? This is the guy you're going to pull a fucking no contest on? This was bullshit. This was one of the stupidest fucking endings in the history of wrestling. Fuck this match for this fucking ending. Sabu in a no contest? What the actual fucking... And immediately, the crowd was on it. Rocky here was on it. Everybody was on it. Bullshit. The crowd was chanting, bullshit. And I was chanting, bullshit. And Rocky was chanting, bullshit. Yeah, because it was. <laughs> uh, and then we got into a match that, honestly, I had completely deleted from memory. A feud that I forgot ever existed. A tag team that I had erased from the time-space continuum. Y'all remember when Mick Foley turned heel and tag-teamed with Edge? And him, Edge, and Lita were like a weird little faction. <laughs> and it was so they could take on ECW. What the fuck? Uh, but it was great. Mick Foley, I mean, first of all, look, Mick Foley is one of my absolute all-time favorites. And I can tell you guys, uh, having read uh, multiple of Mick's books, this match was right up his fucking alley. Like, he probably had a great fucking time doing this, uh, knowing how he feels about Edge and how he feels about the opponents in this match. So it was uh, Mick Foley and Edge versus Tommy Dreamer. And Terry Funk, the fucking legend. Um, and, you know, before the match, you have both Foley and Edge dropping heel promos. Uh, Foley's especially was cracking me up because he was like, I want to credit the creator and the innovator and the, the savior of ECW, Stephanie McMahon. <laughs> Ever since the invasion angle. Yay, invasion. I was like, Oh my god, I fucking love Mick Foley because he knows he knows everyone hated the invasion angle. It's like that's the perfect way to be a heel, is just be like, yeah, that was great, that was good shit. Um, but yeah, I really loved this match. Uh, you know, and, and then Edge in his uh promo, he said that the crowd has fake girlfriends and that they all jerk off to Lita, and that and then Lita uh, even cut a promo and said Tommy Dreamer can't get any action and blah blah blah. And so um, Terry Funk and Tommy Dreamer come out actually with Beulah McGillicuddy, and she cuts a promo on Lita saying, like, you know, uh, usually the gross things uh, I hear uh, are going into your mouth instead of coming out of them or something along those lines. Um, but basically this actually turns into, like, a six-person tag match, and it was this was fucking unhinged. Like, first of all, you had – uh, 61 year old Terry Funk taking a bump off a ladder, but then, like, as soon as they get the barbed wire stuff involved, like, that shit was nuts. Like, they had the board covered in barbed wire, uh, they drop it on Tommy Dreamer, and I was like, oh my fuck. Um, 
And then uh, Foley and Edge go to pick up the board. And then uh, Terry Funk from outside the ring actually grabs each of their ankles and they trip and they drop it on their face. Uh, and then uh, next thing you know, the baseball bat uh, with barbed wire comes out. And uh, at one point, Mick Foley is tearing. Um, are they sorry? They hit. Uh, they hit Dreamer with the bat a couple times, and then Foley wraps his arm in barbed wire is what it is. So he actually takes the barbed wire and wraps it around his forearm. He fucking hits Terry Funk. At one point, he's, like, ripping his eyes out. Oh, this shit looked fucking hard. Uh, and, you know, Terry Funk screaming, my eye, my eye. And Crimson Mask is an understatement at this point. Um, so Funk actually it leaves, and now Dreamer is like left all, all alone, and all of a sudden uh, you've got uh, they're beating up Dreamer with the baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire again, and Lead is uh, dropping leg drops on the on the bat on his balls, and fucking they bring out Sako and they're doing spots with Sako. Um, they do this the so the combo where uh Foley's got the Sako and then the spear edge hits the spear um and then uh so this was like uh the spot with uh Beulah where they go to Sako Beulah and then Tommy like explodes and tries to save her but they beat him up again and then Edge is doing like this is like straight out of the Vince McMahon playbook uh Edge is uh, doing like a pump handle slam to Beulah, like insinuating some kind of gross shit. And Lisa's, uh, Lita's like talking shit. And the next thing you know, Terry Funk comes back <laughs> out of nowhere with a fucking two by four wrapped in barbed wire. He goes in the ring, makes the save. He lights the fucking two by four on fire. Now we've got flaming barbed wire two by four. Um, he hits Foley several times with it. And then Foley lands through the fucking board with the barbed wire uh and then edge throws funk into the broken board also and then dreamer hits a ddt uh and then he's doing a, a cross face with the barbed wire which looks pretty intense uh lita interrupts and then beulah finally gets a piece of her and then uh dreamer driver to lita from tommy dreamer and then edge uh, uses the barbed wire to hit that reverse neck breaker thing that he does. And then uh, while Beulah's checking on Dreamer, he actually spears the shit out of Beulah, folds her like a cheap fucking uh, cheap uh, sun chair. Why did I say sun chair? Deck chair. Fuck. Um, but he folds her and covers her like Rhea Ripley. Again, kind of gross. Uh, but that was the end of the match. And it was a fucking, it was crazy. Like, it was a bloody fucking match. Uh, but Foley and Edge end up getting the win. And then we get a little bit of a breather here. We get Balls Mahoney versus uh, Tanaka. Shout out again to my guy Peter Westlick, uh, who uh, he was the one that requested the other ECW One Night Stand review. Um, but ultimately, uh, Balls Mahoney and Tanaka, uh, they end up fighting outside. Kind of standard matchup for us, actually. Pretty standard wrestling match until they get the chairs involved. And then uh, Balls gets his special chair. And he fucking absolutely cranks Tanaka. Like, leaves a full dent in this chair and covers them for the one, two, three. Uh, we get, like, a little uh, bit where uh, I forgot about Eugene. Kind of, you know, I think I selectively forced myself to forget about the character Eugene, uh, but Eugene comes out and is trying to tell the ECW crowd a poem. Obviously, this is supposed to make everybody hate him, and he's not understanding that they hate him. And then the next thing you know, Sandman comes out, and essentially this angle is Sandman comes down and beats up a mentally handicapped man and chases him out of the arena. Cool story. <laughs> uh, but again, Eugene, very classic fucking Vince McMahon humor and character. Uh, and then finally we get the actual main event, Rob Van Dam versus John Cena for the WWE title, which Rob says he will rename the Extreme Rules uh, title. 
and it's an Extreme Rules match. And this is by far and away the most one-sided crowd in in the history of any pay-per-view ever. I have never, ever, ever seen, at least in the modern era, a match where every single person in that crowd was so unanimously against John Cena to the point this man tried to throw his gear into the crowd and they threw the shit back. There was like a whole five minute thing before the match of John Cena just trying to throw his t-shirt in the crowd and they kept throwing it back. It was awesome. This was like pure vibes. This literally was like the kind of shit of like, when you have that kind of like level of um, excitement in the air before the bell even rings, like this was like Hogan and Rock standoff at WrestleMania levels of fucking palpable energy. Uh, you could cut the tension with a knife. And again, the whole shirt bit with the crowd, absolutely fucking hilarious. And then you get like the actual match itself. Uh, it was a good match. You know, there's a lot of good spots. I mean, uh, Rob Van Dam and Cena. I think Cena uh, really put in his weight on the performance. Uh, but it really comes down to the end of the match. Um, Edge comes out in a motorcycle helmet and a long leather jacket and spears John Cena through a table. Um, giving Rob Van Dam the opportunity to hit the five-star frog splash. And then Paul Heyman comes out to replace the referee that got knocked out. And he counts the one, two, three. And Rob Van Dam wins his first world title in the WWF or WWE. Um, and yes, from what I remember, I think it, that was the title that became the ECW championship. And I also think that they used the Paul Heyman thing as like part of an angle to try and say that like Rob didn't actually win it or some bullshit. If I remember, but like in that night, in that moment, that was the ending that you needed. And, you know, Rob celebrating with Paul and the rest of the ECW originals um, and just getting to enjoy that moment of, again, getting that world title win for, through the money in the bank at ECW One Night Stand in perhaps one of the most cathartic storylines from a personal vantage point of the wrestler themselves that I think I can ever remember. Um, because, like, especially, like, the way that ultimately things kind of ended with WWE and Rob, I definitely think this was like the the uh, the peak of his WWE tenure, and you know I think it's something also that he himself as a wrestler obviously would look back fondly on of like okay yeah that was like one of the big ones for me is like those two ECW one night stands putting the first one together and then uh, winning the title at the next one like I. I would imagine that, um, you know, those stand far above uh, many others uh, in terms of, again, specifically the WWF portion of his career. Because, uh, honestly, the best part of Rob's career is all in ECW. Uh, and if you haven't watched any of those matches, holy fuck, do I ever recommend you go back because they absolutely hold up. Uh, Rob has always been one of my favorite wrestlers. Absolutely He's just a cool fucking dude, um, you know, who's, who stands on principle but in the right way uh, and, you know, is still willing to do business and is just actually, like, one of the chillest fucking dudes I think that's ever existed in the wrestling business, almost maybe to his detriment at times. Uh, but that's enough for me. This one's starting to get a little bit long-winded. ECW One Night Stand really holds uh, a place in my heart because um, I, I loved ECW growing up, and I was sad when it went away. And so, you know, when One Night Stand first came back, before it became, like, the bastardization of what ECW uh, always was and represented, um, you know, these first two One Night Stands, like I mentioned, they are very much representative of, I think, 
what ECW was and also what it could have been. Um, so again, ECW One A Stand 2005, 2006. It, to me, it's like you watch them together and they're damn near perfect. Uh, if you could just take the main event of Rob and John and throw it on the end of the 2005 show, I, I think that would be like the most perfect pay per view of all time. But hey, like I said, that's enough from me. Help me out. Super kick that subscribe button. Follow the show. Share this around. Send me some questions, guys. What else do you want to see reviewed on the show? What else do you want me to talk about on this bullshit? Hey, join the live stream. We're Saturday every 420. We're doing something, whether it's a review of a show, a review of a week. Uh, last a couple weeks ago, I, I, uh, I did a top 10 king, queen of the ring, or sorry, top 10 king of the ring winners. Uh, so, you know, whatever it is you want to see. Hit me up at Jack Luce now on all my socials, or you can just send emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com or jump in on the live show in the comments. Like I said, Saturdays at 420. But until the next time, I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. A positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pulled the rats on raps. I'm never primitive, but animalistic, vicious. Characteristics, hereditary potency, epistetic means, yo. Ever the eat MCs at extraordinary speed. Some of the beers like, some of the rings of blues and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail with low stakes. I'll take a hacksaw to you cockeyed, mumble rap slack jaws. Leave you shredded on a side like some coleslaw. The double time with the clothesline from hell. Like Bradshaw, I'm toxic like septic shock. A dying breed like anorexic dogs. My appetite.